have a really, really special guest, someone very dear to my heart and who is a big inspiration for me. And she is here in Bali with us. And her name is Bandana Tawari. She is a beautiful, beautiful journalist, um, sustainability activist. She was an amazing editor at Vogue India, editor at large for 13 years at Vogue India. And she writes for some of the most amazing publications in the world and um, such as business of fashion and just various things talking about activism and sustainability in our life as we see it right now. So please welcome Vandana. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, family. Oh, man. Uh, we're so lucky to be in Bali together. Yes, absolutely. We're both from the fashion industry and I just want to riff with you about what is going on in the fashion world now that the pandemic is happening, that everything is changing, that people have been on lockdown and staying at home, all the things that are coming out about fashion and um, the kind of panic that's going on in that world. Can you, can you tell us a little about that? Yes, there's panic. <laughs> there's panic because the system has just been dismantled. And the reason why it dismantled so quickly is because it was dysfunctional in the first place. Um, the entire supply chain of fashion has come to a grinding halt and uh, I don't want to sound pessimistic but the reality of it is this dysfunctional system of globalization, homogenization put all, all the bets on the richer countries, right? So when the supply chain disrupts, the billionaires continue to be billionaires in uh, affluent western countries and the producing, the manufacturing countries like Bangladesh Vietnam, their economies come to a grinding halt because the factories are shut down. So we've seen very clearly how uh, dis uh, destructive this, this whole system has been and then we need to now address it, redress it, mm -hmm. because we cannot continue to have this, this way of functioning where only few people profit on the backs of millions that are continents away. Yeah. And what do you think is going to happen to the big, um, you know, the big fashion houses and fashion shows and um, that industry is in itself as well? Well, we can't possibly have as many fashion shows as we did, um, you know, before COVID. Um, leave alone the carbon footprint mm -hmm. of these kind of fashion weeks, right? I mean, it's just, can you imagine millions of people uh, go to Paris for one fashion week. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the kind of production, the, the numbers that are required, it was excessive mm -hmm. to begin with. So now I, in my very humble opinion, I feel, yes, there are going to be less fashion weeks. There's going to be more sort of online fashion weeks already. Russia Fashion Week did that. Mm -hmm. um, that does not mean that people don't want to be engaged mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, touch and feel and they want to go and see, see the drama and the theatrics and the creativity of fashion shows. But I reckon it's going to be smaller. It's going to be more salon-like. Yeah. Uh, like it's going to be back infrequent. Back in the day. How like it back in the day. Yeah. Um, because it had become obnoxious. Yeah. And yeah. I can say this not because I'm being ungrateful, uh, for having worked in the fashion industry for 13 years and been to Paris Fashion Week and Milan and you name it. But the scale of these shows had become unimaginable. You know? It was almost waste, right? Wasteful. Um, think about it. Every magazine would send four or five minimum people mm -hmm. per magazine to cover the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that entails the travel. Mm -hmm. entails. So I think shows will not be dead mm -hmm. but they've got to be more mindful mm -hmm. of everything environment the people the engagement do you just dip into a city and then for one week it's fashion week and that's all you get to see or are you going to culturally immerse yourself too mm -hmm. is there something that you can give back i think events need to have fashion events need to have much more purpose than a show of consumerism absolutely and some of the um some of the brands now, do you think that they will be more sustainable with their clothing and go slow? Um, or how do you see that playing out? You know, there's so many rungs of 
uh, fashion mm -hmm. in, in the industry, right? So you have fast fashion, first of all, which is... Destroying the, biggest, the planet. <laughs> destroying the planet, the biggest polluter. Yeah. The, the ethos of fast fashion is faster and faster. Yeah. You know, bigger is better. Mm -hmm. And so the whole idea of take, make, waste comes from fa yeah. fast fashion. And that's such a linear um, paradigm that has harmed the environment. Yeah. So they need to change in terms of their supply chain, mm -hmm. the recyclability at a massive scale. Um, because they're, they're the ones who are making millions and millions and millions of clothes every mm -hmm. month, right? Yeah. So in fact, there are some amazing statistics. Um, the amount of clothes that go into a landfill, it's one garbage truck per second. Wow. So that is about one in two Empire State Buildings in a day. It is the whole of Sydney Harbour in a year filled with throwaway clothes. So if we're throwing away that much clothes, do we really need to make that much? So fast fashion's got to address this at a very massive scale to affect change, right? Then you have all the big brands, the conglomerates, you know, the, 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 the Dior's and the Gucci's and, and they've got to now reassess their systems and their supply chain and say where can they make all the incremental changes uh, so that they could start their journey into sustainability and a lot of them were already started. The fact is consumers are going to really ask for it. Mm. You know, they will, they are now equipped enough to, and we've seen during COVID times, everyone's had a little bit of a mm -hmm. consciousness shift. shift yeah. So be, they should be prepared because the consumers will ask between two beautiful shirts, you know, which one will I pick? I will pick the one that is sustainably made. Mm -hmm. But I'm most optimistic about the younger upcoming brands who have started small, who've sown the seeds of sustainability from day one. Mm -hmm. So as the brand grows, sustainability and the sustainable practices grow with it. They have a loyal following. Mm -hmm. It's not about bigger is better. Mm -hmm. And they have a following that also uh, align themselves with the ethics of the brand, mm -hmm. right? Um, they give back to the communities that they create from. Mm -hmm. Most of the, uh, them work with dyers, artisans, weavers, and there's always a portion of their profits that is plowed back into the very communities that have helped them create their labels. And, you know, that's a great template to work with beautiful regional brands mm -hmm. so that wherever we travel, we can buy from that region, mm -hmm. celebrate their culture. The idea that I have to have a shirt where the buttons come from China, the cotton comes from Bangladesh, the stitching happens in India for one shirt. Do we really need that? Mm -hmm. If I'm, to, I'm here in Bali, I want to buy local. Mm -hmm. And we need as consumers to make that mind shift. Mm -hmm. So it starts with the consumers you're seeing now these big major players making this shift. You, you've mentioned that Condé Nast is saying from the top down now that the two pillars are video and what, sustainability? Mm -hmm. Why are they making this shift? Is it because the, the consumers of content and of these garments want that? Or is it because there's a conscious shift in these organizations or are they just seeing this as this is going to be the way and we have to get on it because that's how we're going to make the more money in the future? It's a combination of that, right. right? But I think fundamentally it is they are aware. All companies are aware. If they don't make systemic changes, then they won't survive. Right. Because we know for a fact that humanity and consciousness is going to move in a certain trajectory. It can't be that wasteful. Mm -hmm because we will not survive. Right. You know, if our lives are threatened, um, then we will change. And so companies have to change alongside. So it could be because it is the talk of the moment, sustainability, and you want to be on top of the game, and you want to be engaged, be seen to be engaged. Mm -hmm. And whichever way it comes across, I don't care. But you need to do it, right. because the world will demand, the consumers will demand that of you. And, and that's, that's one of the reasons why Condé Nast, which is the biggest 
publishing house that owns all these huge labels like Vogue and GQ and Vanity Fair, Wired, you name it, they made a commitment that they would go carbon neutral by 2030. Now when industry leaders of this kind make a commitment of this kind, then, you know, everyone else follows suit. So I actually don't care about the intention per se, mm -hmm. but if you start the process yeah. and that has good ramifications, that's good enough for me personally. You see all these incredible shifts. People are protesting in the streets right now, all over the world as we're talking about this. People want change from a, fundament, a fundamental level. It's, it's encouraging to see these bigger companies talk about these things. Um, there's a few questions I have. I think one is, is what is this concept of sustainability? What does it actually mean? I mean, it's being kind of, kind of greenwashed, right? Mm -hmm. Like to you, what do you really think the essence of sustainability is? I have very strong opinions about sustainability because I've heard it in so many forums and so many conferences and they're all wonderful. Everyone has their own version of it. So if you go to Scandinavian countries like Copenhagen, uh, Denmark and Sweden, uh, you will see that it's a small population. People are well fed, they're affluent. So their ideas of sustainability comes from technology and innovation because they have the money to plow into research and development, right? So they're the ones who are coming up with incredible technologies where, you know, the clothes grow with the child, mm -hmm. so you don't have to keep mm -hmm. buying clothes. Uh, there is uh, fabrics of, of all kinds being made from mushrooms, algae, mm -hmm. pineapple waste, food waste, Amber. and it all comes from great research and technology. So that's wonderful. Um, but when you come to countries like India and Indonesia, mm -hmm with populations that are, in, India is a billion plus. Mm -hmm. uh, Indonesia is huge too. So wh where do we start our sustainability dialogue? Because we are talking about big portion of our population that is hand to mouth existence. Mm -hmm. So the whole of idea of R&D and innovation takes a back seat. But these are agrarian cultures. So cultural sustainability comes top of mind yeah. because right, they work from its village economies. Mm -hmm. It's made by hand economies. And so handicraft is a big, big employer. So can we start from the grassroots and talk about sustainability that is, you know, particular to a region? Right. So you can change your definition depending where you are, but at the heart of it is how do you sustain yourself first? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you sustain yourself first? And so for me, that's an entire philosophy in its own right. Mm -hmm because that's personal responsibility. Right, right. Which brings me to tying in sustainability with spirituality, right? Yeah. And what's your opinion on having, uh, do you need spirituality to exist with uh, sustainability or can you, can you go without it? <laughs> I think they're so interrelated. Yes. And the more I dive into it, more I realize if you make sustainability something that is a personal journey, a personal journey of frugality, of uh, wastelessness, of no greed, loving the environment, worshiping nature, understanding the power of nature, if that is my personal quest, it's not only a sustainable quest, but it's a spiritual quest. I want to be in alignment with the interconnectedness of the universe. I care for you as much as I care for me. I care for animals and I care for the plants and I want to eat healthy and I don't want monocrops because I know it uh, degrades land. So everything's so interrelated and this, this way of living can be so mindful and that leads straight to spirituality and sustainability. So if people start thinking about sustainability as a spiritual practice, which starts from here, you know, in, in your guts and in your soul and in your heart and your mind, then it's individual change that leads to collective change. Ooh. Because if, if yeah. we just keep saying sustainability with no personal ownership, then we always think somebody else is gonna solve the problem for us mm -hmm. because it's so vague. Mm -hmm. But if I say it is about sustaining myself, my life in a healthy, respectful way, then I start make changes, start making changes in my own life. Absolutely. 
Yes. Ooh, mama. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And so with that being said, that you know, I remember going to film school, you know, over a decade ago and we're talking about these topics then. And it was about your own little changes and recycling and you know, turning your lights off and people have heard this stuff and, and it's clearly that we're still on this trajectory. We're still having these conversations. Um, what do you think it takes for an in individual to really make that shift, that click? And maybe you could talk about your own personal journey because I think you know, that's an incredible. There's so many ways you can make your shift, right? I mean, everyone's not that daring to move from one destination and go to the other or move to a farm and live a much more frugal life. Mm -hmm. um, I feel if our storytelling on sustainability changed, okay, and we, we told the story in a way where it applies to your life in a realistic way, I'll give you an example. So you go and pick up a T-shirt that costs $2.99 today mm -hmm. and say, wow, it's cheap, mm -hmm. it's cool. The fact is that t-shirt would have taken as much water as you would consume for two and a half years. Wow. So then you start thinking, that t-shirt? We're talking about lands that are getting arid, water problems in India and Africa. And then you start valuing what you buy and what, what, what it takes for those clothes to be made. That's, that's a fact, two and a half years. That's one t-shirt. So I, I feel that we need to humanize these stories mm -hmm. about sustainability because, you know, otherwise it's just reports with number crunching. Absolutely. But the reality is way deeper and darker when you start putting these, uh, changing the narrative mm -hmm. of sustainability. And yeah, I mean, as I said, everyone can't make massive shifts in their lives, mm -hmm. uh, move their families around. We, I'm lucky because I got to move from Bombay mm -hmm. to Bali and my whole journey uh, in life changed because I was walking barefoot on the ground, mm -hmm. surrounded by nature. It just, it's, you know, it opens your eyes to what kind of kindness and compassion that you need to bring into the world. Exactly, and what you don't need anymore. Yeah, and what, what you, you don't need you anymore. I keep advocating um, fashion diet. Mm. Yeah, fashion diet. It's so simple because we go on diets all the time yeah. to cleanse our systems, right? So why can't we go on a fashion diet to just calm down the consumerism? Um, I think what it also means is that we have to protest for this too. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there needs to be an a activist mode that needs to reject the system. We need to be activist designers, activist creators, mm -hmm. activist consumers. Because if you don't think with that mindset, then you're just looking at the product for what that product is. Product for product's mm -hmm. sake. Beauty for beauty's sake. Mm -hmm. And now we know that the world doesn't work that way because there are faces behind those products. I got chills when you talk about that, you know, because this is about waking up on, a, on an individual level, like to be the activist consumer, the activist um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a mindset is, I think, a really new concept for most people because um, maybe most people don't see themselves at that, but you can be an activist in your daily life just by the choices that you're making. And now, Everybody is taking to the streets. <laughs> Activism is a big thing. It's almost like you can't, you can't not be in this day and age or you're just a sheep. You're a part of the problem. And that's what they want, right? They want you to mindlessly buy their shit. Absolutely. And we can't have that anymore. So what activism does is, apart from activating your mind, is you start thinking about a product very differently. So we, I come from we come from a fashion background, so we know very well how we perch a product on a page, on a ramp, and we believe that that's, that's it. Yeah. You know, the beginning and the end of a dress is what you see on a model on a ramp. We don't know the backstory, we don't know the forward-thinking story, nothing. It is just that. 
But the fact is that product is useless if we do not engage and respect the people who made it mm -hmm. and the processes that it takes for that product to be made. So the process has to be honored too. Is it a slow process that employs people for a longer time? So we put food on the table for a longer time? Mm -hmm. So that process of making, whether it's made by hand, made with care, made with sustainable fabrics, the process is extremely important. And, but again, that process means nothing if there's no purpose to it. How does it give back? Is there fair wages involved? Do we give back to the community? Are these big corporations giving back to the very communities that they're working with? Look what just happened, you know, not to cut the flow, but that was the problem, right? Is that what, those big orders, right, that just got canceled. got canceled. And then all of that population in India now is not no longer worrying about making garments, but whether or not they're going to be able to eat and eat. So yes. during COVID, we're talking about starvation. Can you explain how the mechanics of that work? Because I don't think everybody fully and, understands. And also in India, they um, a lot of things came out that they weren't being paid for their time. And yes. they're still um, expected to work. Is that correct as well? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, so, it's such a layered problem right now. And it's not just India. Mm -hmm. So talking about COVID-19 and the kind of harm that it did worldwide, it's the poorer nations that have suffered the most, it's especially related to the fashion industry, right? We know that the artisans in India, for instance, have no work right now. But one of the countries that got very affected by uh, COVID-19 was Bangladesh mm. because their GDP relies a lot on the rag trade, mm. which is basically all these huge billion dollar companies that are from affluent Western countries. And when they canceled orders in the tune of more than $2 billion, the country came to a halt. Mm. So people there are not worried about COVID-19 getting them, they're worried about starvation. Yeah. So the poorer people have been pushed back into deeper poverty because of this dysfunctional system. But thank God for social media, because now these companies are being called out. Um, there is a hashtag payback where you can literally tag the brand that hasn't paid. And you can see from their feeds, you know, thousands and thousands of people who are appalled mm -hmm. at this level of irresponsibility, cancelling orders which was for clothes that were already made mm -hmm. or put into order in a contract. But these big brands have big lawyers mm -hmm. and so they have all the loopholes to get out of it. And some shamelessly still haven't paid while the owners are billionaires and their workers and the factory workers in countries like Bangladesh are living in penury. So how do we create a balance and reject this kind of um, society where this level of disrespect has to be er eradicated? Mm -hmm. We're not treating people as human beings anymore in our fashion industry. Mm -hmm. They become faceless, invisible. We don't even ask when we're buying clothes, what, do we know what fair wages is? What is a living wage? Um, what about health benefits? Who looks after their kids? Mm -hmm. uh, what about childcare? These, there are a lot of these companies that don't understand that in that value chain, everyone's not protected. And it's usually women who suffer the most because almost 80% of garment uh, workers are women. Mm -hmm. And a big chunk of that work in unorganized sectors, right? So they don't have labor rights. They don't have labor right unions to support them, support their um, their needs and their wants. There's no one who can look after them in the way an employee, a caring employee mm -hmm. can. can. Mm -hmm. So when government policies are not protecting you, then corporate policies have to protect them too. So it is a rigmarole right now. It is in a state of deep stress, mm -hmm. but I hope that, you know, eyes will open, hearts will open, mm -hmm. and you know, big companies, small companies, they start making changes that benefit the entire chain of human beings that touch our garments. Right. So this is about consciousness linked to sustainability. We're looking at a paradigm that's got a lot of different moving parts from the top of the corporate chain 
if the leaders don't care, then the actions of the company are going to show that. So this is a perfect example where they're constantly upholding the bottom line above yes. humans, above human rights. I mean, this is criminal and it's evil, it sounds, right? What is it going to take? And do you think these big behemoths who are already, you know, the Titanics have set sail, can they recorrect course? Do you think that um, these big, the big ones, the big guys can change, will change? Maybe there's some that you are seeing doing it right. They have to change. There's no option. Because we can't live in this world where the haves and the have-nots there's such a huge divide. The owner of Zara is the seventh richest man in the world. He's a multi-billionaire, right? And the people who are producing clothes for his company are getting, I don't know what, few cents per unit. Right. So this system has to be rectified. And you're right, it's a human rights issue. Clothing is so deep in its involvement with labor that we forget that human rights is very much part of the game. If you start looking at this profession in terms of human rights, what you're doing in Bangladesh as a very rich company is a human rights violation. Mm -hmm. And then when you look deeper into it, it's also about gender rights. Because if most of those people are women, then you're violating gender rights. So it's not just clothes. You can bring in gender, you can bring in um, human rights. There's a whole plethora of uh, engagements that the fashion world has to address mm -hmm. because it's not just a t-shirt. So we can say, oh, I, you know what, I'm sustainable because I buy the uh, eco t-shirt. Mm -hmm. That's not enough anymore. Mm -hmm. it has, it, we as consumers need to be completely dedicated to understanding the systems. Yeah. Because when we understand the system, then we see what kind of violations are taking place yes. and we will not stand for it. Right. What is happening now is, is that when you see what's taking place, we haven't necessarily see it. Everything is so far removed, right? Like, again, going back to this, we all know that we're supposed to be more conscious in our buying, in our buying choices, more conscious in what we do. But most people, the general population, don't really fully change, do they, until something dramatic happens. I think for the first time I've found um, hope that this is possible because the corporations at the top aren't going to change unless the buying behaviors change, really. I mean, unless they have a conscious revolution of heart at, at the top level, at, right. in the boardroom, and they all, they all change. Yes, and that's one of the problems. When we say we want to change of heart in the boardrooms, we need more women in the boardrooms to make sure that there is the heart involved because for far too long these industries have been so masculine mm -hmm. so patriarchal that we need women leadership to come in mm -hmm. and if you notice the fashion industry is pretty much um, run by female consumers mm -hmm. it is the bags and the shoes and the dresses we account for more than 70 80 percent of uh, uh, consumer buying habits it comes from the female population but if you look at the boardrooms of these top brands, it's a smattering of women. So boardrooms are full of men and the manufacturers are full of women. It's very dysfunctional. And this gender divide is what's causing one of the biggest problems mm -hmm. where we have men who cannot empathize with the problems along the chain mm -hmm. of production. And I personally believe a lot in female leadership at the top. In my opinion, the difference between female leadership and male leadership is this, that men can sympathize, but I know that women can empathize. I can be in your shoes. Mm -hmm. I will know that what it means to be pregnant, to juggle two kids and a career and cook and look after her husband who probably doesn't help around the house, right? So. We are poised to take on roles where we start thinking about a lot of the other people mm -hmm. in this supply chain. And men have failed us in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is my personal opinion, but I stand very strongly by it. And as a man, <laughs> I would agree with you. 
And it's interesting because in our work, which you and I do in our healing work, 99% of the time, well, 90% of the time, most of the time, <laughs> it's women who are the first to step in and say, I'm ready to open up and heal and change. Um, they seem much more empathetic, um, sympathetic, all of the above. And therefore, I, I, I remain questioning what has happened to my male brothers, right? Where I see that this egoic male, masculine driven mentality, left brain, more, 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 solo, individual guy, grow, 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 hit the numbers, boom, 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 boom. We also as men are not happy. None of that stuff in the boardroom with the egoic label, none of these, those people are happy. None of them are truly fulfilled. Yet we see this, this structure, this male driven structure, egoic structure, destroying the planet. Why do you think that is? I think, you know, patriarchy is embedded because of intense indoctrination over centuries. And this level of patriarchy has sort of cemented the idea that leadership comes from this masculine energy and that masculine energy, the power that is demonstrated is of a certain kind. That it cannot be empathetic, it cannot be sensitive because it's, you know, almost like 1980s va va voom. We've mm -hmm. got to show it, we've got to kill it, we've got to, it's, it's a very brutal assertion of power. And we've done this for eons. The acts of femininity or feminine principle entering the, this hardcore, brutal, brute force. Who's going to change that? Mm -hmm. So I think we need a completely different system of education, if you ask me, mm -hmm. which is more spiritual, which is more in tune with nature, to talk about energies. And literally, I mean, it sounds facetious, but understanding what the yin and yang uh, balances mm -hmm. so that we appreciate this and we appreciate that and the coming together of that would perhaps make you a better person and be able to engage in your work and your life and mm -hmm. other aspects in a more compassionate way but are we taught that in school mm -hmm. not at all when did the act of creativity become so uh, profane fashion is showing us that instead of being sacred that what we are wearing, what someone has created, someone has made with a hand, whether it's in a factory or sitting in a village with a loom, it was always a sacred act of creativity. And we turned it into a manufacturing uh, monster, mm -hmm. right? And then it, when it becomes faceless, heartless, mm -hmm. and the, sacred, the sacredness goes out the window. Mm -hmm. And therefore we don't respect people for what they make and the kind of effort they put into the things we love and enjoy wearing. Mm -hmm. But we are not taught this. No. I'm so glad that you talked about the balance because um, on one hand, you could have a swing to the complete other side where you have a dominance of female energy in, in, in all of this, right? And maybe that's necessary for a time to swing back, but really this is about the balancing of the male and feminine energies um, and, and that they coexist and co-create because that's what creates our greatest gifts and strengths. Would you agree? Absolutely. I am a big proponent of co-creation, you know, because it takes you even further ahead of collaboration because you're both co-creators. Mm -hmm. So there's humanity in that. There's an exchange of ideas, love. And so for me, post-COVID, the fashion of tomorrow would be a fashion of compassion, yes. Fashion of made by hand, slow fashion, mm -hmm. things made mindfully, um, things bought mindfully, not bought mindlessly so you can wear it for three days and then shove it inside your closet and you don't have to worry about it, don't think about it, or worse, you'll put it in a dustbin that goes into a landfill. Um, I really believe that if people start focusing on cultures now, because cultures, regionality, as opposed to globalization, because this mess is because of this rampant globalization where everything was homogenized. Everyone's wearing the t-shirt, the hoodie, the jeans, right? We forgot indigenous cultures of creativity. 
So when we travel, most people when they travel, even if they came to Bali, they'd probably go and buy an H&M t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Or a Zara. You know? Or just like an Adidas. Yes. But do, will they buy um, an ikat fabric and turn it into a jacket? You know, a lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. So we need to encourage people to start digging into their own backyard now because we're not going to be traveling that much. Mm -hmm. We're going to choose our destinations very carefully, mm -hmm. right? So where now I may not have the luxury of saying, oh, this collection of mine was inspired when I went two continents away to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now here, here's my collection. Mm -hmm. You won't have that. In fact, you'll have to look into your own background, deep dive into your own culture, mm -hmm. and then rediscover what you had forgotten about your cultural provenance. And so I think there's a level of authenticity that could come into the industry because resources are going to be limited. You'll have to get resources from your backyard again, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You can't have, you won't have the luxury of shipping and organizing because the supply chains have just been dismantled for a while. It's going to take time for them these things to be rebuilt. So then what do we do within our own countries? Mm -hmm. How are we going to co-create within our own countries? And if that is where we're going to reach, I think it's wonderful because then you're going to engage the indigenous crafts that were long forgotten or not promoted. Mm -hmm. So it could be a good sign. This could be a revival. Yes. Like a renaissance. You know, when I, I hear you talking about, I hear about, I think of the, um, the artists as the activists as the warriors telling stories and um, when it, whether it be a brand campaign or you know the purpose behind the products and and all of this stuff it makes it, it's exciting right and I think the little guys get this right yeah. um, again I wonder if the big guys will if that it would even work for their model but you did the project that was really cool which I think illustrates this so great which was the journey of the jacket is that yes. what it was called can you talk about that because I think sure. it's beautiful sure it's called the traveling jacket, the traveling jacket so it was a story that I did uh, for Vogue India and the whole idea was we wanted to celebrate India and all the countries surrounding it and so that includes Pakistan Maldives Bangladesh Sri Lanka, uh, anyway, the, the Indian subcontinent, basically. So I thought, what's that one editorial that can bring one powerful story, and, but involve all these countries? So I got in touch with some stellar designers in each of the countries, and the jacket, the framework of the jacket started in New Delhi in India with one of our top designers called Rahul Mishra, and he started making one part of the jacket, then packed it up, and then shipped it to Pakistan. It reached uh, Lahore. The designer was waiting there. He works on the back and he uses very much Pakistani embroidery, a, a tribute to his own culture. Who is the Pakistani designer? Um, mm -hmm. uh, Zishan Ali. Cool, beautiful. And then he packs it up, then he sends it to Bangladesh. And there the designer Humaira Khan is also, she uses Dhakai, which mm -hmm. is the Dhaka gets its name from that particular kind of fabric and then it goes to Bhutan, then it goes to Nepal. And it was really interesting because I couldn't really find a designer in Nepal um, because the Nepalese buy a lot from India. So I, think, I don't think that the fashion industry is that strong there, but I found phenomenal jewelry designer. And she went to the temples of Swambunath in Kathmandu picked up the bones of the animals that were sacrificed in the temples and she said, I wanted to give dignity back to the animals. And then she carved beautiful belt and uh, the buttons and she did an extraordinary job and added on to the jacket and then packed again and off it went to Bhutan. So, so basically it traveled all around. And then we have a one, one sort of, it looks like a haute couture jacket, you know, which has so many stories. Now, who wants to throw that jacket? Right. Who would throw that jacket? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of narrative, that's the kind of nostalgia mm -hmm. value that we need to put into our clothes. Mm -hmm. And that can only happen if it's made slowly, if someone is meditatively thinking about creativity. Um, oh, so it, it's, it's, it was a wonderful story. It was so gratifying. I was just the conduit. Mm -hmm. There were designers, artisans involved. Um, but this is the kind of story that I thrived 
by, you know, live by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we get the link to view this? Yes. Okay. I'll cool. send you the PDF. I can even send you the video that we made. That would be great. As I, I know that the viewers would love to see that. I'd yeah. love to see it as well. You know, when you're talking about slowly, this is a concept again. We're going back to this theme of can you be sustainable without being conscious? Can you be conscious without this pursuit of spirituality? Um, that in all, you know, spiritual doctrines, really ones that are worth adopting, I feel like it's that concept of slowing down, yeah. be present, yes. right? And the way you describe this is the meditative process of creating something and, and in your process of, of purchasing and searching, slowing down your consumption and being more mindful, which doesn't just mean do your research and not buy this, not buy that, but shifting your perspective as a, a buyer more consciously pulls out a more creative exploration, right? Like, which is beautiful, I think. I, I love the idea of slow fashion, but it's seldom recognized as something being important and urgent in this industry. We did it really well with the food industry. The slow food movement mm -hmm. literally changed the way people ate, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then led to veganism, mm -hmm. which is all about mindfulness in what you eat. Mm -hmm. And why should it not apply to the fashion industry? If you go to artisanal villages in Indonesia, in India, Cambodia, you name it, and you see how the weavers sit with their looms in their homes and how much time it takes. If you're not in that meditative state, it's impossible to weave a beautiful garment. You can see how the weave will form by seeing what kind of attitude the weaver has. There's a great story from India where um, someone wrote this paper where if there is discord between husband and wife, weavers in one home, you can see it in the pattern. Mm. You, so have to be, you have to be in sync okay. because it is slow, it is time consuming. And isn't that what mindfulness is about? Yeah, well, I think it goes back to everybody that's involved in this and every harm that's being all, all the harmfulness and all the the light that um has been put at the bottom is because all of these big corporations all of the people involved everybody do, um, isn't looking within themselves they're not thinking about um their soul anymore they're not they're not thinking from a place of compassion from love from meditation if everyone sat and meditated every day they wouldn't make decisions like what's been going on right if they just went back into themselves so is it possible that we could teach the ceos <laughs> how to meditate is it possible that we could put people who are amazing men um in front of these men to teach to reteach yeah you know those you know, roles we grew up we grew up I, i'm talking about we as in because you know i studied in an English medium school, um, most of the people in the workforce, corporations in India, or in the Indian subcontinent, we all talk, speak in English because we all went to English schools. So we studied Western philosophy right. before we even studied East, Eastern, Eastern philosophy. And in Western philosophy, you always start, and it used to be my mantra because, mm. you know, I'm a writer, so does I think therefore I am. Mm -hmm. So we put so much value in the thought and the thinking that we didn't say, I feel, feel. Therefore, therefore I, I am. am. Now when we say, I think, therefore I am, and your mind is like you know, zipping around and you're in this hustle and bustle of hustling world, mm -hmm. then you think of ideas of consumerism, how to make more how to make speedy, uh, mm -hmm. uh, use speed to make more, right? So we have a system that is always in a hurry, competitive, uh, to make more and more. But if we just paused and talked about Eastern philosophy, and we talk about like, bringing meditation, then Eastern philosophy, like, like yoga, the first line in Yoga Sutra is, Yoga is the cessation of the mind. Mm -hmm. It is in the thoughtlessness mm -hmm. that you reach profound states, right? Mm -hmm. It is actually the pause between the breathing in mm -hmm. and the breathing out mm -hmm. that is more valuable. Yeah. And so 
then that affects how you look at your life, how you work, how you implement change or implement rules within your um, offices. And so we need the shift mm -hmm. in the more Eastern direction because Western philosophy has culminated into a world where consumerism has become number one. Mm -hmm. And then it affects everything else mm -hmm. of overproduction. Absolutely. You made that shift, a huge shift. You were in the scene, the top of it, mm -hmm. um, and you you went on your own journey and, and literally uh, journeyed across the world. And can you share your story? And yes. I think that would be great. Yes. I mean, 13 years in Vogue India at a time, India just opened the luxury market. So can you imagine it was when the Louis Vuittons were coming in, the Gucci's and this very exciting times, all the big stores were opening. There was parties and I had to write all these stories about these wonderful designers. I had the most amazing time. I was also not very conscious at that time. So it didn't matter that for me, it was a joyful job. I was flying all over the world, interviewing top designers. I ticked off pretty much every designer that you can think of, went to the best parties, all the fashion shows, you name it. It was wonderful. It opened doors for me. I met creative people par excellence. But then I started feeling a little guilty because it is ridiculous that I live in India and not feel guilty about the fact that there is a watch being sold for like $50,000 and that $15,000 can give electricity to a village for three months or whatever. And how could people not put that kind of value to the real value to money? So it was my personal journey. It has nothing to do with the corporate culture. It was my own personal journey. And then moving to Bali sort of cements that idea, ideology mm -hmm. because you see that how little you need to have a beautiful life, that you can be much more authentic in the job that you do. And so I decided to resign very gratefully and become uh, a sustainability activist. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the person that changed my path was Mahatma Gandhi because for some strange reason, when I was flying to Bali to live here, I just kept thinking of Gandhi on the flight. And I thought, how funny. He had such amazing principles for living, the Gandhian principles. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if we can apply it to the fashion industry. So when I came back, when I reached Bali, um, I started researching and I found an incredible essay written by Professor Gonzalez from the Rome University um, called Gandhi's search for sartorial integrity. Sartorial is fashion integrity? What do you mean fashion integrity? So uh, to cut a long story short, it is basically finding your truth through the choices, the clothing choices that you make. Wow. That can your clothes point to your moral transparency? Wow. Can it guide you to be a morally upright person by the clothes that you wear? And Gandhi was an example of that journey. And he had that journey. And I did a TEDx talk, talk based on this. And for me, it was such an eye opener. So I went deeper into uh, researching and the Gandhian principles were just staring at my face and I could apply it to the luxury business. So especially with sustainable practices. So we have something called Ahimsa, which is nonviolence that Gandhi subscribed to his entire life, nonviolence in thoughts, deeds, and actions. And he said, this is his quote, that nonviolence is not a garment that you take off and put on at will. Its seat is in the heart and must always be there. And so when you talk about nonviolence in thoughts, deeds, and actions, then it relates to everything that we do in life, how we consume, how we create. Uh, it involves the environment. If you want to be non-violent towards animals, you don't want to buy fur, you don't want to be non-violent towards the environment and have sustainable practices, it goes to the heart of ahimsa or non-violence. And there were other, you know, other uh, wonderful principles that he followed. One of the vows that he took, I think, was aparigraha, which is non-greed. Mm. I mean, these are, you know, well-researched, long, uh, you can write essays based on just one term. Uh, sarvodaya, which means welfare for all. 
you can't just keep rising on your own and leaving everyone behind. Mm -hmm. It has to be welfare for all. So it applied beautifully to the fashion uh, uh, business. And um, I was called on to give a keynote speech in Condé Nast Luxury Conference in Oman. Mm -hmm. And it was called Mindful Luxury. That was the conference. I thought, damn, mm, I got the speech for this. Yeah. And when I gave the speech on Gandhi and his sartorial journey, I was amazed to see top managers, top um, executives of very, very big brands all willing to listen. It was almost, they were primed in that moment to sort of accept an ideological shift or at least think about it. Mm -hmm. Because when I talk about Gandhi, it's not that I give you a PowerPoint presentation with an Excel sheet and say, this is what you need to do. This is a call for an ideological shift. Mm -hmm. And um, as we were talking about this, if CEOs of companies have this ideological shift, mm -hmm. they can transfer this right through their company, right? And I think my purpose, I found my purpose. So I go around the world now giving these kind of talks. I'm going to uh, work on a very a deeper uh, speech on spirituality and sustainability. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time I'm actually talking about it, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Well, it, it, this, is, this conversation is transitioned so perfectly, right? Because we're talking about the issues that are, we see in, in, in all of this. We talk about how to fix them. We're talking about the corporate level. We're talking about the board level. We're talking about the, the, the street level. But really, all, lead, all roads lead back to yes. one point. Yeah. Your inner self, that inner journey, raising your own conscious, um, your own consciousness, yeah. right? And that because the power of the individual, we forget as consumers, I make the decision to go and buy something. Mm -hmm. I make the decision to pull out my wallet and use my hard-earned money to buy something. So forget the collective right now. I need to make an individual change. Mm -hmm. And if everyone started gearing into that zone and focusing on personal responsibility, then collective change will definitely happen. Like this. Exactly. Like this. But we have to take ownership. Yes. What advice can you give to um, a lot of our viewers who are, you know, in their 20s and 30s who resort to buying at the big places in the fast fashions? What advice can you give them on how to switch up um, and where to buy that t-shirt that they might actually need or where can they shop that's more... Yeah, what brands are doing it right? Yeah. My advice to people who want to go on this sustainable journey incrementally, mm -hmm. everyone doesn't make changes dramatically, maybe it's not feasible, is today we have the information of each of these brands on our fingertips, mm -hmm. whether it's on Instagram, Facebook, or their own websites, mm -hmm. right? I think a little bit of research into what their practices are will take you a long way into making a better choice. Mm -hmm. And we have no excuse not to know enough about a brand before we buy it because we are using our hard earned money to buy it. So you can put in that little extra bit. The second thing I hear all the time is, oh, sustainable products cost a lot more. And in my opinion, it should because it takes more money to have a transparent system that pays workers well, um, that looks after uh, people as human beings, uh, worries about the packaging, to how much transportation, to carbon footprint. It takes a lot more money to be transparent and sustainable. But if you have to pay a couple of dollars to have a cleaner conscience, please pay that extra two dollars. Mm -hmm. And that something to wear with pride, with story, right? Something that you are proud of wearing. Proud of wearing, you're going to be guilt-free. You know it's going to be disposed of well. You know it's going to biodegrade. And it's not a polyester that takes 500 years or more when for one t-shirt to, uh, to disintegrate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, we go back to personal choices. Yeah. Will you make that effort, yes. that little extra effort and that little extra dollars? So don't buy the 10 t-shirts. Buy five, mm -hmm. but buy those five in the right way. Mm -hmm. I love that. We can't make, um, we need conscious solutions, right? For all of these world problems. And we can't come up with conscious solutions from an unconscious state. So 
it's like the, the one theme always remains. And the number one thing that you can do, that you can take away, I feel like, from all this is develop yourself consciously. Correct. Mm -hmm. Conscious consumption, not conspicuous consumption. Mm -hmm. And that comes only from individual will. So I'm sick and tired of like waiting for governments to change policies. And, you know, let's start from us. Because that's the easiest. Yes. And I think, I'm not sure if I finished my train of thought before, but I think for the first time I'm, I'm feeling so um, inspired by humanity because now they are taking to the streets. You know, the Black Lives Matter that's taking place. And it's, it, it wasn't just the States. It's London. It's Europe. Around the world, people are going into the streets saying enough is enough. And that had to do with civil rights issues. But these are all civil rights issues, aren't they? And of I feel course. like that movement, the power of social media, the, the power of seeing everybody go into the streets, to take that time, that energy, to put their lives on the line, to globally say, change. we want fucking change. It's like, how can you sit complacent now and not begin that journey? Like, will there, we don't know, will it all just snap right back? Will People just still be buying the fast fashion once we're allowed back in the streets. Can you can you go back, or do you think there's going to be a greater chasm created between now this conscious movement as it seeps into everything and the old way, the way it was? I'm trying not to be cynical about this because it <laughs> is a frightening no, we got to be world real. order. But I think you know the good are going to be better, mm -hmm. the bad are going to be worse. Mm. I think it's going to be a very divided world. One where change is going to be beautiful, inclusive, respectful, and then the other side, which is going to be more vitriolic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the Bangladesh problem, right? When the factory workers were denied their money, um, the whole world was up in arms. It didn't matter if you were uh, sitting in Finland or you were, it was a collective voice that came from all parts of the globe to stand up for factory workers in Dhaka. You know, shows that people care. People it, care. It reinstates faith, uh, my faith in humanity, you know, yeah. that people care. We people. can start a movement and change anything now that we see. And you said it, like we make the choice. If everybody stops buying, their power is completely gone. Like this round of Black Lives Matter, the protest, which ha happened not just in the US, that happened in several parts of the world, right, is going to be the benchmark now for yeah. any kind of protest. Because any kind of equality that you see in one country, the, there are, there'll be several other countries that will also stand by and take to the streets like they did this time and for we'll Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. You can't hide from it. The media cannot control yeah. or hide or sweep under the rug that amount of people, that movement. Yeah. And I think that this now movement will give more inspiration, more morale for the conscious army, the yeah. global conscious army, to take to the streets every time. So it's almost like these companies, these corporations, they really got to they gotta play it yeah. safe. All the traditional institutions that we were indoctrinated to believe wholeheartedly, blindly, whether it was government institutions, healthcare, police, mm -hmm. they've all dismantled, right? They've all dismantled. So I wonder who's going to create this new order. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about this in the morning. What is the governance of tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Look like. What does it look like? What does conscious government look like? Putting the health of your community, the health of your country before the health of your economy. And, and we think that by doing that, we won't be able to profit, we won't be able to thrive. When in fact, when the, your community, when your people are healthy, they're happy, they're thriving, your economy as a byproduct naturally is going to thrive yeah. and explode. In, we, in fact, Mahatma Gandhi himself was a believer in, in uh, what he called village economies. He wanted to call them village republics because he wanted them to be decentralized, that each unit yes. functioned and supplied for its yes. unit. Mm -hmm. So imagine an artisanal India. Mm -hmm. This is pre-colonization. It was one village would have the dyers, the weavers, the cobblers, the, the milkmen, 
and they supported their own ecosystem, and then they traded what they made in excess. But each village did that, and it was one of the richest countries because it, it, it thrived in this system, in, wow. in, in this pyramid of grassroots, you know, and the whole country became so affluent that before colonization, the global GDP from India was 23%, okay? Post-colonization of 200 years, when the country got completely looted by the British, they were left with three to four mm -hmm. percent. Meaning and that colonization in that model was less effective, less prosperous on every level. On every level. But it also worked because they knew, the colonizer knew where to cut the, the strings. And they started from grassroots. They started dismantling the, the village economy. Because they knew then, it worked. Because there it was power worked. there. It worked. And it would take it from the system. Yeah. Right. And, um, and I just wrote a piece for the business of fashion which talks about is fashion the new age colonizers, right? Because what we saw in Bangladesh was no different from an entire country mm -hmm. held at ransom by some rich companies. Right. Mm -hmm. There's, there's solutions be? in this which are beautiful. And I mean, we can keep going forever, I feel like, <laughs> on, on this tip. I mean, what would you want people to take away who are listening to this? What, what is the, the message that you really want people to, to think about? I would like every individual to take personal responsibility, to believe in the power of self, and hold yourself accountable. We are living in a world where there's so much to be fixed, but we need to fix ourselves first. And so let's not think of a utopian world when we in our hearts are not in that space. So whether it's about consuming, creating, manufacturing, it doesn't matter what you are, whether you're a chef or a DJ, we need to have a conscious shift of compassion in our heart. And then what we buy and what we eat and how we look after others and the environment, they just come into place. Woo! <laughs> my girl. Say, it, so that's amazing. When's your book going to come out? <laughs> I'm pretty lazy to write a book. <laughs> can you tell everyone where they can find you and your Instagram handle or your social channels? If you want to. Hi. <laughs> if you want to, you can find me uh, on Instagram and Twitter. It's at Behave Bandana. Mm -hmm. So I, I misbehave a lot, so that handle is called Behave Like a Bandana. <laughs> behave Bandana. That's it. I'm not on Facebook, sadly. Um, that's about it. Beautiful. Thank you so Thank you much for being for here. Thank you. So lucky to be in Bali with you guys. And uh, for all those watching and listening, please subscribe, share this uh, message with everyone. And um, if you are interested in taking that next step to develop consciously, you don't know where to go, Shayun, myself, and Life Force Center, we offer a free transformational program. So you could just click the link in the bio. It's bit.ly slash TLC morning ritual. Um, or check out our Instagrams as well. And thank you so much for listening. Mwah.